July 1986, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. A Marine is nearly killed during a controversial hazing incident, which inspires the hit movie A Few Good Men. David Cox, one of the Marines involved in the incident, speaks out against the movie and files a lawsuit. In January 1994, Cox disappears from his home before he is found murdered. After that, the trail went cold. Did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's gonna do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know, that Santiago's death while tragic probably saved lives, and my existence while grotesque and incomprehensible to you saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the code red? I did the job. Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of The Trail Went Cold. I am your host, Robin Warder, and I've got a pretty unique case to cover today. Uh, you probably recognize that famous soundbite we just played from the 1992 blockbuster courtroom drama A Few Good Men, which starred Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson. And the reason I played that particular clip is because A Few Good Men actually plays a key role in today's mystery. As I have mentioned on previous episodes, I am a frequent writer for both Crack.com and Listverse.com, and have published over 100 articles between the two websites, many of which cover mysteries and true crime. Now, the case I'm going to talk about today was actually covered in an article I wrote for Cracked in September 2013, titled Six Movies You Won't Believe Are Based on Insane True Stories. Uh, a lot of you may not know that A Few Good Men is very loosely based upon a real-life incident, but the mystery I'm going to discuss actually took place after the movie was released. But uh, before we get started, let's get a few pieces of business out of the way first. I would like to thank everyone from the Unsolved Mysteries forum at the Sitcoms Online message board, and also the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit for all your comments and feedback about the first two episodes of The Trail Went Cold. And as you probably noticed, I have responded to your most important piece of feedback by investing in a new microphone. Uh, it's a very good device called a Blue Snowball, so the sound quality is going to be considerably better from now on. I should mention that The Trail Went Cold now runs on a bi-weekly schedule, and a new episode is posted every other Wednesday. We've now got our own Facebook and Twitter pages, and we're also available for download on iTunes now, so if you like this podcast, uh, be sure to subscribe to it. I need to provide the obligatory shout-out to McGill Foote, who does a masterful job of editing and assembling this podcast together for me, and is my fellow co-owner of The Back Row, the pop culture website which hosts this podcast. And, of course, a big shout-out to Vince Nitro, who composed the eerie music you hear on every episode of the show, and probably makes my narration sound a lot more ominous and creepy than it really is. Uh, so anyway, let's get started on today's mystery. Our story begins in July 1986 at the U.S. Naval Base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, which is often referred to as Gitmo because its airfield designation code is GTMO. Now, as I'm sure you're well aware, Gitmo has become a hugely controversial place since the start of the 21st century when it became a detention camp for suspected terrorists, but it still had its fair share of controversial incidents long before the war on terror got started. In case you're not familiar with Gitmo, the U.S. actually refused to give up the base when Castro took over Cuba in 1959, and ever since then, the Cuban government has never been too thrilled about having an American military base on their soil, so uh, things have been pretty tense down there for several decades. Uh, anyway, one of the Marines who was stationed there at Gitmo in 1986 was Private First Class William Alvarado, and he had been writing to a senator about alleged misconduct which was taking place at Gitmo, uh, including an incident where a Marine allegedly fired shots illegally into Cuba. So uh, once Alvarado's platoon got wind of this, they decided to target him for a Code Red. And in case you're not aware, a Code Red is slang for a ritual in which military men will perform hazing on one of their own if they believe he has fallen out of line. 
Code Reds can best be described as an informal disciplinary action because officially they are seriously frowned upon by the military and they're as illegal as hell. And unfortunately, this particular Code Red went horribly wrong. What happened is that 10 Marines from Alvarado's platoon decided to blindfold him and stuff a rag in his mouth before they dragged him out of bed and started shaving his head. But Alvarado, he started choking because of the rag stuffed in his mouth and his lungs actually filled up with fluid before he passed out. As a result, the Marines were forced to put a stop to their hazing and get Alvarado some medical attention. Uh, Alvarado did manage to pull through, but since this illegal Code Red nearly killed him, uh, as you can imagine, they shit hit the fan. Uh, each of the ten Marines who participated in the hazing faced disciplinary action, and they were all offered a plea bargain in which they could plead guilty, meaning that they would receive an other-than-honorable discharge. Now, an other-than-honorable discharge is not exactly a nice thing to have on your record, and it will definitely bring a permanent end to your military career, but at the very least it would mean you would avoid having to face a court-martial, and you wouldn't have to do any jail time. Anyway, seven of the ten Marines agreed to take the plea bargain, but three of them turned it down because they believed they were simply just following orders and technically hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, one of the three was Lance Corporal David Cox, who just happens to be the central figure in our story. Now, uh, turning down the plea bargain, that was a huge risk for Cox, because he would have to face a military court-martial for attempted murder. And if he was convicted of that charge, he could potentially receive a 20-year sentence at Leavenworth Penitentiary. And it was a difficult case, because it would be tough to prove that Cox was simply following orders, because technically, it was more of an implied order. Apparently, while addressing the issues involving PFC Alvarado, the platoon commander had said something along the lines of, If you men are good Marines, something should happen to Alvarado. And that's quite different than saying, I order you to give this guy a code red. But uh, in the end, Cox's risk actually paid off. At his court-martial, he was only found guilty on the charge of simple assault, which only carried a 30-day sentence. And since he had already served 38 days in the brig by that point, his sentence became time already served, and that was that. Cox got to serve nearly three more years in the Marines, and then he received an honorable discharge. Okay, so if you've seen A Few Good Men, a lot of the story probably sounds familiar to you. Uh, but in case you're not familiar with the movie's plot, uh, it involves Tom Cruise playing a Navy lawyer who is assigned to defend two Marines who are being court-martialed for murder because they performed a code red hazing on another Marine at Guantanamo, and this time they accidentally caused his death. And in the movie, the victimized Marine is named William Santiago instead of William Alvarado. So yeah, the parallels aren't really too subtle here. Of course, in the movie, the two Marines claim they were ordered by their superiors to perform the Code Red, and Cruz's character spends the movie trying to prove that the base commander at uh, Gitmo, played by Jack Nicholson, personally authorized the Code Red. And of course, that leads to the very famous climactic You Can't Handle the Truth scene, in which Nicholson admits in open court that he did order the Code Red. And of course, that ending is considerably more dramatic than how the real story turned out. The guy who penned A Few Good Men was none other than Aaron Sorkin, who first wrote it as a stage play before he adapted it for the big screen. Uh, Sorkin, of course, is one of the most famous writers in Hollywood, because he's given us such TV shows as the Emmy Award winning The West Wing, and he's also penned many successful movies, and even won an Academy Award for writing the screenplay for The Social Network. And yes, as you've probably figured out, A Few Good Men was inspired by the code red hazing of William Alvarado in 1986. And that's because Sorkin's sister was a lawyer in the JAG Corps, and she actually defended some of the Marines who were involved in the hazing. And that's what prompted Aaron Sorkin to concoct a fictional story which was loosely based upon the real-life incident. And by now, you're probably wondering, how did this open the door to an unsolved mystery? Well, let's fast forward to December 1992. A uh, Few Good Men is released into theaters, becomes a huge hit, and it's seen by many people, including former Lance Corporal David Cox. Now, by this point, Cox is living an ordinary civilian life, but when he goes to see A Few Good Men, he can clearly see that the movie was based on a real-life incident that he was involved in. And he becomes pissed off about it. In fact, Cox is so pissed off that he gathers five of the other Marines who were involved in the original Code Red incident, and they all organize a class action lawsuit against the production company Castle Rock Entertainment. The suit alleges, and I quote, they stole their real life story, changed a few names, and passed it off as their own. And you know, I kind of hope Castle Rock responded with, haven't you guys ever seen a Law and Order episode? I have to say, I do question the validity of this whole lawsuit because movies and TV shows present fictionalized stories based on real-life events all the time. A Few Good Men, it never tried to pass itself off as a true story, and it didn't use any real names, and other than the basic setup of the story, the whole narrative is quite different than what actually happened. Now, personally, if I was David Cox, and I found out that someone had made a movie based on an incident where I nearly killed someone, I'd probably be grateful they didn't use my real name, and I wouldn't be inclined to go public and cop to the whole thing. 
but Cox, he seemed to have a lot of personal pride, and he did not like how his story was depicted. It really bothered him that A Few Good Men ended with the two accused Marines still getting a dishonorable discharge, even though their commanding officer had admitted that he ordered them to perform the Code Red. Cox didn't like the idea that the Marine who was given the Code Red died, which did not happen in the real incident he was involved in, and Cox felt he deserved some compensation for having his story told. And by the sounds of things, he was a pretty outspoken guy. Uh, Cox did several radio and newspaper interviews in which he criticized the film, but it didn't even end there. Apparently, he also became quite vocal when talking about how the U.S. military operated at Guantanamo, and this made his friends and family very uneasy. Anyway, the story took a very unexpected turn on January 5th, 1994. Uh, at the time, Cox was 27 years old and living with his girlfriend in his hometown of Medford, Massachusetts. And that day, he mysteriously disappeared from their home. Uh, Cox's girlfriend returned that day and discovered that he just wasn't there. And even stranger, Cox's truck was parked in the driveway with his keys in the ignition and an uncashed paycheck of his was on the dashboard. Uh, Cox had also been working a temp job as a driver at UPS, and earlier that day, they had actually left a message on his answering machine to inform him he was going to be hired full-time. Uh, they asked him to call them back, but he never did. So Coxy never returns home that night, and nobody has any idea what happened to him until the first spring thaw. On April 2nd, Cox's decomposed body was found in a wooded area near a riverbank five miles out of town. Uh, he had been shot three times in the torso and once in the neck with a 9mm, so the murder appeared to be done execution style. And Cox, he still had his wallet on him and his credit card, so it was clear that robbery was not the motive here. And what's also interesting is that even though the murder scene was in a fairly remote location, it was strategically located between two separate gun clubs in the area, which means that even if some shots were fired at Cox in the middle of the day, they probably wouldn't have attracted too much attention. And unfortunately, that's pretty much where this story ends. I've seen no indication that the investigation into Cox's murder has made any tangible progress during the last 22 years because there is really no evidence to work with here. I have no idea if the police have ever turned up any possible suspects or figured out what the motive could have been. Uh, the case was profiled on a 1996 episode of Unsolved Mysteries, but other than some articles I found online from the Baltimore Sun and New York Times, there really isn't that much information out there about this case, which is kind of surprising given that it's associated with a very famous... Hollywood movie. In fact, I was also unable to find out if the Marines' lawsuit against Castle Rock Entertainment ever went anywhere after Cox's death, so uh, I guess you can say the trail went cold. So I guess it's probably time for me to offer my own personal theories. Let's start off by looking at the circumstances of the murder. Uh, there were no signs of struggle inside the house, and since Cox's truck was found in the driveway with his keys in the ignition and his paycheck on the dashboard, you could assume that he was in the midst of leaving the house and going to cash his paycheck somewhere before he was interrupted. It's most likely that someone abducted him, probably at gunpoint, and forced him into another vehicle before they left the scene. If Cox had decided to leave with someone willingly, it's very unlikely he would have left his keys in the ignition or his paycheck on the dash. Now, given the circumstances, I suppose it's easy to assume that Cox could have been the victim of some grand government conspiracy, and that once he started going on the radio to talk about the Code Red incident and the inner workings at Guantanamo, that some higher authority sent an assassin to have him killed. Well, I highly doubt that's what happened. I mean, I'm sure the military wasn't too thrilled about Cox going out there and advertising that A Few Good Men was based on a rather unsavory incident from their past, but this is far, far from the worst skeleton that the United States military has in its closet. Uh, this is an incident where a bunch of Marines, who may or may not have been following an implied order, got carried away and nearly caused the death of one of their own, but I don't think that's an incident that would compel them to have Cox murdered, uh, especially since all it would do is bring a lot more unwanted attention to the situation. And besides, Cox was killed a full year after A Few Good Men was released, and he'd already been doing interviews about it for months, so if someone really wanted to silence him, they sure took their sweet time about it. So I really don't think there was any cloak and dagger activity involved in Cox's death. And, okay, I suppose I should address one other thing. Yes, I am aware that A Few Good Men was a Tom Cruise movie, so I'm sure there might be some people who could speculate that Scientology was behind the whole thing, but no, I'm not going to go there. Now, during the Unsolved Mysteries segment, there is a brief interview with Cox's brother in which he presents another possible theory involving David's work at UPS. Uh, apparently months earlier, David had told his brother that one of his supervisors and a driver at UPS were involved in some sort of theft, so it's possible maybe someone from Cox's workplace had him killed. Uh, it, it's certainly possible, but unfortunately I can't find any more information out there about this angle, so I really can't elaborate on it. And besides, I've actually got my own personal theory about what happened, which I will explain right now.
There's one detail which has always stuck out for me during the Unsolved mystery segment about this case. Uh, Cox's attorney was interviewed, and he expressed his own personal belief that the murder was somehow related to the military. And at one point, he uses the quote that Cox was wearing his Marine Corps jacket, which he never wore. Now, to me, that's a very intriguing clue. Unfortunately, I don't have any specific information about the particular jacket Cox was wearing, but they implied it was the type of jacket that a Marine would never wear in public once he left the service and became a civilian. At this point, Cox had been a civilian for nearly five years, so if he'd gone that long without wearing this particular jacket, it seems very unlikely that he would just pull it out of the closet if he was leaving the house on a routine trip into town to cash his paycheck. I couldn't tell you the exact reason why Cox would put that jacket on, but it does make me think that someone else connected to the military was in his house that day. Now, there are also two other details which make me skeptical that Cox was planning to leave the house to cash his paycheck. Number one, he was dealing with a back injury and had to spend the night sleeping on the couch. This makes it sound like he wouldn't have left the house that day unless he really had to, though I suppose going out to cash your paycheck might qualify as a good enough reason. And the second strange detail is that when Cox's girlfriend came home that afternoon, his pet rabbit was running loose. And apparently, Cox always kept this rabbit secured in the kitchen any time he left the house. Since it was a cold January day, I wouldn't discount the possibility that Cox went outside to warm up his truck and was planning to go back into the house to put his rabbit away before he was accosted by someone. Unfortunately, even though all the sources say that Cox's keys were in the ignition, I couldn't tell you with 100% certainty if the truck was actually running when they found it. But I am also intrigued by the detail that a 9mm gun belonging to Cox was found in his truck's glove box. I don't know if Cox kept any other weapons in the house, but what if he was being visited by someone he believed to be a threat? Cox could have pretended that he was going to drive into town to cash his paycheck or something, when in actuality, he was just using that as an excuse to go outside, go into his glove box, and grab his gun. However, Cox's assailant wound up stopping him before he could grab the gun, and abducted him from the scene. Now, if this scenario is true, then who could have been responsible? Well, my personal theory is that it might have been one of the other Marines who was involved in the original Code Red incident. Let's do the math here. Out of the ten Marines who participated, seven took a plea bargain and accepted other than honorable discharges, which permanently ended their careers in the military. Six of the ten Marines, including Cox, were involved in the lawsuit against Castle Rock Entertainment. So, I gotta ask, were the whereabouts of the four other Marines involved in the incident, were they accounted for on the day Cox was murdered? Once again, if you do the math, you'll realize that at least one of the four Marines who was unaccounted for had to have received an other than honorable discharge. Let's put it this way, if you receive an other than honorable discharge from the military, you might have a tough time adjusting to civilian life. Hell, David Cox, he finished his tour and he received an honorable discharge, and he had trouble translating his skills to the civilian job market. Cox kind of wandered from job to job for years, and earning that full-time position with UPS, that was probably his biggest break since he left the Marines. Now, just imagine how difficult the situation might be for a person who left the military under less than favorable circumstances and has an other than honorable discharge on the record. I'm envisioning a scenario where one of the seven Marines who took the plea bargain had their life go completely to hell after they left the Marines. This person struggles to find gainful employment, they fall into poverty, and it seems like their life is going absolutely nowhere when all of a sudden they find out that a hit Hollywood movie has been released which is based on the incident which essentially ruined their life. Then they see one of their former servicemen, David Cox. He's doing all these interviews with the media where he talks about the incident, and he describes this major lawsuit he's got going against a movie studio, where he's got the chance to cash in and potentially earn millions of dollars. This former Marine can't stand the idea of Cox living a successful civilian life and profiting off the incident which ruined his own life, so he decides to take out all his rage on him and has him killed. The killer visits Cox at his home, and since Cox recognizes him from his time in the Marines, he willingly invites him inside. Things start to go wrong, and it leads to Cox putting on, or being forced to put on, his Marine Corps jacket. Maybe the assailant forced Cox to put it on as some sort of symbolic gesture. Anyway, he then abducts Cox from the house, takes him out to the woods, and shoots him. Now, of course, I might just be blowing smoke here, because for all I know, maybe the investigators already did check into the alibis of the other nine Marines, and cleared them all as suspects. But, working with the information I have, I think this is the most likely theory about what happened to David Cox. So that's about it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed learning about the true story behind A Few Good Men and its unlikely connection to an unsolved mystery. Uh, anyway, if you happen to have any important information about this case that has never been shared uh, and could potentially solve this case, please contact the appropriate authorities. But if you have your own theory about what might have happened to David Cox, I'd love to hear from you. Hell, if you have some interesting information that wasn't covered here, feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email. I can be reached at robin.warder at primus.ca. 
That's R-O-B-I-N dot W-A-R-D-E-R at P-R-I-M-U-S dot C-A. Robin Warder at Primus dot C-A. So be sure to also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and iTunes. And you can also check out my true crime and mystery articles at Crack.com and Listverse.com. And there's also plenty of other non-true crime content you can find right here at the back row. So that's about the end of this. Have yourself a good two weeks and join me next time for another edition of The Trail Went Cold. The Trail Went Cold is part of the Back Row Podcast Network. Visit d-back-row.com for more. The theme song was composed by Vince Nitro. Thank <laughs> you.